Howdy again, it's Tubal Cain, your YouTube shop teacher at your service. And today I'm starting a short series, there'll be several parts of the video, on how to make a tap follower. Now several other YouTube creators have already done this, but this is a little bit different uh, spin on that, so bear with me on that. And uh, first of all, I'm going to explain what a tap follower is. Now, if you haven't seen a recent video series on making this bell center punch, you might want to check that out as well. Uh, the purpose of a tap follower is that on the drill press or the lathe or the milling machine, you can uh, literally f have a spring-loaded follower that will hold the tap into perfect alignment with the hole that you have just drilled or bored. So uh, let me talk about these three followers here and then I'll go over to the drill press and, and show you how they're used and then talk about how I'm going to make uh, this and I'm going to make the middle one a little bit different from the other two. Taps are manufactured two different ways. Some of them have a center hole like you see here. Others do not have a center hole and I, that depends on the manufacturer and how they're holding them when they manufacture or grind these. Some, uh, well obviously this company uh, held it between centers. There's a center hole on each end. This company, there, you can see there's no center hole there and uh, it has more or less a conical shaped uh, top on it. So depending on which you have, and usually you're going to ha have them in the smaller sizes like this. You can see both styles there. But the one with the center hole has to be held with this type of tap follower in the center hole or this type. And by the way, none of these followers have a manufacturer's name on them. I don't remember where I got them. This, this is one I've had for quite some time. There's no name on it. I'm essentially going to copy this one. I don't see any patent on it or any name. And... I'm not sure there's anything you can patent on there because it's kind of an obvious uh, device really. There's not, not too much to it. But if you have this type of tap, then you need to use a tap follower like this that will fit into that. Now on the larger taps, if you find a tap that, well like this for instance, that's not going to work. So then your solution is to hold it in a different kind of tap holder, like, like this. You can hold this kind of tap and this tap holder, and that, that converts it to a, a center hole type of affair. The only thing is it makes the whole thing so doggone uh, long that you have to drop the drill press table uh, to a rather inconvenient uh, height. Inconvenient. Now here's the way I did it for 40 years before I discovered tap followers. And when you drill in the drill press like this, and notice that the vise is locked down, whatever kind of vise you got, and I drill the hole, and the spindle is in alignment with that hole, so you don't want to move anything. You don't want to drop your table either, because you're going to lose that alignment. But since the alignment is there, what uh, you, you would normally do, and that's a quarter inch hole, so I, I'm going to tap this uh, 5 sixteenths and there's several ways of doing it and uh, one is that's just a little homemade center that I've had forever and I'll put that in the, the Jacobs chuck snug it down doesn't even need to be tight for that matter but you can also use um, this type that's a, a, an Enco center or replacement for a ball bearing center so you know whatever you got that's a 60 degree you can make one in a, in a matter of minutes but then you would put the tap in there like this with the tap holder and I'm using my right hand now and just creating some tension on the handle while I tap it but that's kind of awkward because uh, really this is a two hand operation so one way of doing that is to uh, you know I've put my arm up there I put my chin up there all kinds of makeshift ways and I'm going to show you another kind of humorous way here in just a second but that's the way you do it with uh, without a spring-loaded type of tap follower and it's awkward and here's a tap using a Greenfield tap wrench with 
a uh, center hole in it. But in this case, now look at how far I have to drop the the uh, chuck in order to do that. So plan ahead so that you don't have to move anything. And then again, I would hold this with my chin and tap it because you need two hands to tap. But then the larger the tap, the more force you need on it. So I think you can see uh, the argument here why you would like to have a spring-loaded tap follower. I have even used uh, insane methods like putting a five pound weight on the handle here, but that varies depending on the orientation of this uh, three-handled uh, quill feed. You know, I go a little farther, that's going to fall off. Now on the other drill press here, which I prefer, there are four handles there, so you got a little bit more uh, range. This is a, a Duro drill press that I'm on right now. I had a hearty laugh two days ago when I got a comment from somebody, and this is the, the man's name that commented, and he said that he often used a bungee cord. And I had never thought of that, but it's kind of an obvious thing, but there's a bungee cord. Well, it's you got to wrap it around, but th that is holding tension. And actually, that's a hillbilly or a poor man's solution right there. That isn't really too bad. But that's I'm just showing you different methods. I thought that was funny. And this applies to the milling machine as well. But the preferred method, of course, is to use the spring-loaded one that I'm going to show you how to make. So you would bring that down and put some pressure on that. And then lock the quill lock. On this one I have to use a separate wrench. So I've got some travel there. And now both hands are free to turn the tap wrench. And this will follow it down within the range of whatever that was, half inch, three quarters of an inch or so. So that's the beauty of a tap follower. Now let me show you real quickly. I know that I killed a lot of time here before I actually started the project. And some people like this and some say, get on with it, get on with it. Let's go over to the lathe. I'm at the Logan lathe and when I was in my prime this is the way I normally tapped on the lathe and this is just a mock up here and the, the spindle is in back gear which locks it but I would bring a dead center up against there and just using an adjustable wrench and then I would have to follow this with my hand as I tap and actually it works pretty well but again you only have one hand to, to turn the wrench and since I'm left uh, I'm right-handed that makes it convenient inconvenient working with my left hand well then in later years well actually it's quite a while ago I had discovered the spring-loaded type of ball bearing center now, this is a concentric brand and these cost a king's ransom so really nobody's going to have one of these but it is spring loaded and those were just the nuts for tapping on the lathe so that's the way I've been doing it for uh, oh really a, a long long time in that manner and then again using this but of course you could use a t-handle tap wrench but a uh, straight handle wrench often interferes with the uh, the bed and the ways depending on how much room that that you have but this is a great method but that's I'm just showing you alternatives here now and and uh, essentially if you use this spring-loaded tap follower which we are now going to make and you'll have one if you don't already have one and that avoids the expense of this uh, expensive concentric center and this would of course be held in a Jacob's chuck in the tailstock so that's the way to do it on a lathe and you always want to follow up your tap on the lathe and, and that just assures you of a perfectly straight thread what I did not like about these two followers is that they have really weak springs anemic flimsy springs compared to this and this is what we're going to build and you can put as strong a spring in there as you can find but I like a strong spring but just for the heck of it here with my Toledo scale I'm going to show you how strong or how weak these springs are and to satisfy you guys that like the metric system I'm in grams but when I push down on this one 
you will see that I have, when I'm almost all the way down, I'm at about 55 grams. With this one, oh, that's really weak. That's what, about 38, 37 grams, something in that neighborhood. But watch how much more, uh, how much stronger this spring is. See, we're at, boy, that thing bounces around, at least 80 grams. So I like that spring. And those springs look something like this. So they're, they're, uh, they're not small diameter springs. Now there may be a drawing on this later. I'm not sure if Tola is going to make one or not. But it's so simple there's almost no need for a drawing. I'm setting those two aside because I'm not making those. And let's take a look at how this is constructed. And it's uh, really just two pieces. Other than the spring and the screw that I'm loosening up right now. Guess I gotta back it out almost all the way. That's an 832 screw. And we've got a hardened uh, point, 60 degree, with a flat. There's the spring. I put some white on that so I can identify that compared to the other springs and I'll talk much more about that later on. And look at how simple this piece is. It's 5 8 stock turned down to half with a 3 8 hole and a hole drilled and tapped. Now I'm going to go through here with the calipers right now and give you all the dimensions. So you don't really need a drawing, but there may be a sketch or a drawing at the end of the final part. And I don't know how many parts in the video. I never know when I, when I start one of these how many parts are required. Because I like to break them down into 15 or 20 minute parts for your viewing pleasure. Alright, the main part here, this is a 3 8 hole. That's a 3 8 reamer. And how deep it is, is it? Two inches. almost to the end. That way we can get a lot of spring in there because the spring has to compress as well. Now as I told you this is 5 8 stock and it does not have to be tool steel and it's been turned down to uh, 500 thousandth, that's a half inch. The overall length is 2 and a quarter inches People are asking this for, uh, for these dimensions in metric. I really should start doing that because perhaps three-fourths of the people that watch these videos are in countries that use the metric system exclusively. And then we got about 800 thousandths there, which leaves you a balance here of little over uh, one and a half inches. Now on a drawing they never give you, they give you the overall dimension and one of these dimensions. If they give you the other one they call it superfluous dimensions but actually I like a drawing that just gives you every dimension and you don't have to do any math in your head or on paper and you can just forge ahead because that eliminates some of the error but that is not the way it is done. And then this 832 hole is drilled from the end, oh, about 5 sixteenths. That's uh, 312 is 5 sixteenths, so it's just a little bit over. So there you got, I think I gave you all the dimensions there. Break that corner nicely, break that corner. This is at a little bit of an angle, but it could be a, a square shoulder, it could matter less. If you would want to knurl this, you could, but there's no need. Now, on this hardened piece, this naturally is uh, 3 8 and you could start with a dowel rod, and, but you'd have to grind everything on here. But all, all we're doing is grinding a 60 degree point. The overall length is 1 and 3 quarter. The flat from the point, I think I'll take it from back here. From back here is a three point or point three six six, and it is 
indeed right here 750 that came out even and that's all there is to that piece the spring is 3 8 OD and I'll talk, again I'll talk more about that how to get a spring that, that'll fit into that hole 3 8 OD and the length on it is uh, one I'll call it 1.350 and the thickness of the wire is around 36 thousandths 37 thousandths so there's all the dimension if you have to make the spring because they're kind of hard to find commercially in the right size without buying four of them and paying shipping so I think I gave you all the dimensions right then and there and you can make a little sketch or see if I put a drawing at the end alright let's get started making some chips now I'm going to do this on the closing lathe and remember that this gator chuck is almost brand new and there's virtually no run out, perhaps a, a thousandth or so. But you want your project to be accurate so if you have a sloppy old three jaw chuck use a four jaw chuck or a collet. But I'm going to do it on here and I just put the indicator on there just for the heck of it to show you that uh, trying to get the shade here that it's within uh, a thousandth. So I know that I'm going to get uh, accurate holes and accurate turning and all of that. So I already faced it off and now I'm ready to turn. This is 5-8 stock. I'm going to turn the uh, end down. I've got to move it out in the chuck a little bit down to 500 thousandths. Now you can vary these dimensions. If you have larger stock it's not going to make any difference or if you want to make the point a little bit diameter a uh, bigger diameter or, or longer or whatever or this whole thing a little bit longer you know feel free to do so but I'm going to copy this verbatim as I said I already faced off the end I've got the machine set for about 900 rpm and I'm going to use a power longitudinal feed until I strike the stop I like to use a stop I'm going to take it down to 500 thousandths. I'm at 512,000 so this will be my finishing pass and uh, I'll measure it. If it's a little bit off it doesn't really matter because most of the time you're going to be holding it in a three jaw chuck, uh, a three jaw Jacob. So, uh, But if you're going to be holding it in a collet you might want to take it down to exactly 500,000 but I don't want to piddle around with uh, splitting hairs here. And I'm now at about a thousand RPM. I did have to uh, change inserts. It was pretty dull. This steel is not that free turning. It's, it's not 12L14. I don't know what it is. It just came out of my shelf. I don't know where I got it, but it uh, it's old cold roll 1018 at the very best. But it's kind of tough turning. This micrometer doesn't have a lock on it. I'm at 501. I'm going to touch it up just with a file, take it down a half thousand with a file, and I'm done. And that'll clean up the uh, 
surface finish just a little bit. Then I'm going to break that corner real nice with a file, 45 degree chamfer. That just makes it look finished.